perfection, perfection, perfection. Good morning. Welcome to Lost for Words. Thank you for joining me today as we most likely take our last little dive into the work of Miss Elizabeth Bishop. Um, we have been exploring her poetry, um, but today we are going to explore some of her different work, some of her prose. Um, prose is not poetry, but it is still words, <laughs> and they are still wonderful. Um, I would say this is an awesome, awesome book. Um, she has some really great stories in here and writings. Um, she even has some I guess they're kind of like little essays that she wrote about other people's writings of Emily Dickinson. Um, she has all kinds of stuff in here. Um, she has one story in the beginning about a man who lives at the beach and it's like this dark moody scene and his job is to keep the beach clean. And it's like, it's one of my favorite of her prose writings. Um, cause it sort of has this like lighting of like a Rembrandt painting, which I love, but it's funny for some reason on these videos, I have not explored some of my favorite Elizabeth Bishop writings. Um, like probably one of my favorite poems of hers is the fish. It's one of the first, it's the first poem I ever read of hers. And like, I still to this day remember like sitting at my computer when I was like, when I was like 20 years old probably, and reading this poem for the first time and being just like, and it getting swept up in her descriptions of this fish. And then her ending of the poem just being like, sort of like taking my breath away. Um, but I feel like that poem is one of her more popular poems and um, I feel like sometimes for me, um, I did the same thing with Emily Dickinson. Like one of my favorite poems of hers is Hope is the Thing with Feathers and I never explored that poem. But I think it's because like I already had such a familiarity with those poems and love them so much that um, in my explorations on this channel, I wanted to explore things that I wasn't as familiar with to find something new. So um, I just wanted to put that out into the world that there are two of my favorite poems that I've never explored on this channel. Um, and that was why. Um, but today we are going to explore a writing of Elizabeth Bishop's prose and it is called The Thumb and it is the, a description of Elizabeth Bishop um, sort of discovering this perfect woman and her encounter um, with this woman and discovering her personality and all her attributes and the way she moves through a room um, and her attention to this woman is just like fascinating and I, and I love it. Um, and it's also kind of surprising, which was my favorite part. So I wanted today, I wanted to share that with you. Um, have you ever found the perfect woman? Have you ever found the perfect man? Um, Let's see um, what Elizabeth has to say about this woman that she discovers. This is called The Thumb, and it is on page 455 of her book of prose. All right, here we go. Stanley first took me to see Sabrina one afternoon for tea. She had one of those silk-hung apartments with sunlight coming in at the windows. 
through pale lime colored curtains and clear fragrant tea running out of a silver teapot all day long, more or less. By some chance, perhaps, because it was an unnaturally hot day for May, we were the only people there. I could see at once that she was beautiful. And I could feel at once, too, that she had another gift besides beauty, a sort of magnetism, I suppose. Anyway, it was a gift that made people willing to sit and drink tea all of a May afternoon just for the sake of being near her. I had known people like that before some of them not beautiful either, who had the trick of making the atmosphere of a room faintly exciting, charged with a bit of lightning, waiting for a sudden electric storm. Sabrina always had it with her. That was the trouble. It was there even when you didn't want it to be. Well, she was quite a small woman, very little and light, small bones, you would say, or light as a feather. In the first moment, I realized vaguely that her face was extraordinarily beautiful and that she wore a dress colored like dim gold. Gold under water, maybe? Then because it's sort of a game I play with new people, I began to look at her slowly, bit by bit, saving her face till the last. It took me quite a long time to manage the tea drinking and to look slowly enough so as not to appear rude but Stanley saved me from having to talk too much and I kept quiet. Her feet were small and slender and her legs and the line of her thigh was thin too. She was pleasing to watch as she talked to Stanley, full of little motions and quick, almost nervous gestures. Her left hand lay along her knee, her fingers pressed against the soft gold cloth. Her hand lay along her knee her fingers pressed against the soft gold cloth. The hand was palely gold colored too, with a narrow wrist and delicate fingers. A civilized hand, you would call it. Interesting to watch or touch. After a while, I began to study her face and I found it in the same color and fineness. I had seen her hand, her rather sophisticated face, face gay yet quiet, if you could think of a Madonna whose face was thinner about the cheek and chin with a look of humor and something subtly emotional about it, well, that would be Sabrina. Her eyebrows were straight across and black. Her eyes were gray, and so was her hair. Really, I suppose it was brown, dove brown, if there is any such color. I began to enjoy the afternoon immensely. It was a delightful room and I felt slightly exhilarated as if I were intoxicated on tea. Stanley had promised me that Sabrina could do a lot for me if I became friendly with her and I seemed to be succeeding pretty well. She knew just about everyone and though fortunately unliterary herself, she really had quite a little, she had quite a little influence, friends among all sorts of artists and writers. I began to be dangerously elated and I talked and laughed and brought out all my best conversational tricks. I pictured many more such afternoons to myself, maybe just Sabrina and me alone. She was beautiful enough, certainly. Just as I had reached this pitch, Sabrina turned to face me, moving her body and placed her right hand on the left arm of her chair. I was watching her face for a minute. I was just conscious of the pale shape of her hand extending below the gold cloth. Then she suddenly lifted her fingers with one of her quick movements, and I quite involuntarily looked down at her hand. I had already noticed her left one. This appeared just the same hand, small and fine. Why did I keep on looking? There was something queer about her, that hand. I couldn't tell right away what it was. There was no mark no deformity. Good God, the woman had a man's thumb. <laughs> no, not a man's, a brute's, a heavy, coarse thumb with a rough nail, square at the end, crooked and broken. The knuckle was large. It was a horrible thumb, a prize fighter's thumb, the thumb of some beast, some obscene creature knowing only filth and brutality. Well, I looked away very quickly and attempted to think of something light, something joking to say, but I was horrified. 
In the midst of that light, in the midst of that charming sunny room, that friendly atmosphere, I was frightened. Something mysterious and loathsome had crept out of the night and seized me as I sat there drinking tea. Lord! And there I'd been, all ready to fall in love with the woman. I might even now. I still looked at her face and admired, although I could feel the perspiration of fear on my forehead. I tried not to look again, but I couldn't keep my eyes turned away from her hand as it lay there innocently enough on the chair arm. Was it my imagination? I looked and saw on the back of the thumb where it lay in the sunlight, there was a growth of coarse black hairs. Finally, Stanley said that it was time for us to leave. I stood up and my knees felt as if I had been sick and in bed for a week. Sabrina was smiling and I knew I could not keep myself from smiling back, from responding to her beauty. For a second, there seemed to me something corrupt about that beauty. What was that phrase? Flowers of evil? Yes. And yet, when I looked into her eyes, I found my sinister thoughts denied and made ridiculous. Will she shake hands, I thought. She didn't when we came. Maybe she won't now. I simply can't. But Sabrina smiled and held out, Stan held out to Stanley her left hand, as a French woman does. It must have been her custom because he took it naturally enough, and I did as he had done, bowed over her left hand while her right hand hung at her side. She asked us to come again, and Stanley accepted for us while I stood with my eyes fixed on her face. Or Stanley's face, anywhere except down at her right side, frantically longing to be gone. However, I went back again, like a fool, led on by that woman's unimaginable beauty and personality. And the thumb, too, for all I know. Though I certainly tried to forget it. I felt that I'd been wrong if I thought there was anything unnatural about Sabrina. Surely she was no more than she seemed, a charming, intelligent woman who had the misfortune of an one ugly thumb. We talked so well together, we were, or might have been, so much at our ease. Damn that thumb, I thought. I'm going to see as much of her as I can and maybe I'll forget it. But it wouldn't work. Every time I saw her, I felt more and more peculiar, shivering fascination that made me look down at her hand to those lovely, fragile fingers and that horrible, misshapen thing that was one of them. Yet I couldn't blame her. She was the most natural thing in the world. The trouble must be with myself. Some morbid streak in my imagination, I suppose. Something that took the slightest suggestion of horror and magnified it until my whole mind was filled with awful thoughts and dark shadows. Now this time, see that you don't get theatrical, I would say. Then I would sit beside Sabrina. Just she and I alone, and I would begin again. That struggle against the insidious spirit that seemed to overcome me when I was with her. I thought of dreadful things. If she could be in an accident, if something should happen so that her thumb would have to be taken off, I might have fallen in love with her. I surely would have, had not all my emotions been so bewildered and fevered with horror. I had never touched her in any way except always at leaving that slight pressure of her left hand. My mind dwelt upon what it would be like to touch her, to take that hideous hand and hide it in my own. I realized that all this was bound to lead me into something wrong and I couldn't escape it. I kept on going to see her, knowing every time that sooner or later I would yield to my curious desire and touch that thumb. And I hardly cared what might happen when I did. She asked me to see her more and more often and at Last, I realized that whatever was the meaning of my tangled emotions about her, she was in love with me. I couldn't talk to her so easily after that, and there used to be long, silent places in our conversations. She would sometimes look at me with a sad, almost frightened look, and then I would swear at myself and wonder why in heaven's name I didn't leave her as gracefully as I could and never come back. But there I would sit and brood as if bound fast in some black prison, my eyes half turned away from her right hand, which lay in the folds of her dress. One afternoon in September, I went to see Sabrina for the last time. She was in the same room where I had first seen her. The room hung with silk and lime-colored curtains with a pale, soft sunshine coming in at the windows. She had on that same golden dress, and I had truly never seen anyone look so beautiful as she did. She sat there quiet and somehow arranged with her hands in her lap. 
I was making desperate efforts to keep hold of myself, but every second I could feel a dark, choking rush of something. Rage, madness, I don't know what, rushing up from those unholy wells I guessed were in my heart. I sat quite near her. I longed to ask her to forgive my silence to explain the thing. I thought that then I might have sat beside her calmly and have forgotten the old fear. I had just about decided to when she moved so that her right hand was in the light, right under my eyes. I felt myself staring, but I couldn't stop. Her thumb, that heavy, horrible thumb, it was a monstrosity. I put out my hand slowly and laid my fingers across the back of her hand. It was cool and soft, and then I felt that rough, swollen knuckle, those stiff, coarse hands hairs against my palm. I looked at Sabrina quickly and I found that she was looking at me with a peculiar tender look in her eyes and what I could only describe as a simper across her mouth. I have never felt the disgust, the profound fear and rage of that moment. She thought, well, she thought I was going to tell her I loved her. I suppose that anyone except a fool, that is, except myself, would have escaped forever from the dread and disgust of that moment. I suppose that anyone else who had seen that look in Sabrina's eyes and that emotion so unconcealed upon her face would have been delighted. I don't know. I can't even find the right words for my own feelings or an apology for my actions. Perhaps it was because I suddenly felt tired sick to death of the whole affair. I've argued it out over and over again and pictured the whole thing, but I can't make the ending any different. Ridiculous, you say, morbid. Anyway, I got up and left her without a word and I never went back. <laughs> um, this poem, or this piece of prose cracked me up because um, I thought Elizabeth Bishop did a great job of drawing you into this um, moment where this person um, is sitting there and she is um, slowly taking in this other woman, Sabrina, and taking in her features and her mannerisms and her way of being in this golden lit room and you sort of get swept up in it and you're like oh wow what an amazing woman and you just kind of are like feeling her you're feeling her like romanticizing this woman <laughs> and then as she is like going over all of her features it's like fantastic. There's like this moment where you're like all swept up in the delicacy and the femininity and you're like, oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> and then, good God, her thumb. <laughs> there was something about this that reminded me of Sylvia Plath's um, poem. I think it might be called The Onion but it's where she cuts her thumb instead of the onion by accident. Um, I would love to hear Sylvia Plath's um, thoughts on this piece of prose. But for me, like this surprise of this like hideous manly thumb on this beautiful, graceful, feminine woman was hilarious. I was like, <laughs> Because it's like surprising and I'm like, well, how boring if this woman was completely perfectly graceful and feminine and there was nothing to surprise us, right? <laughs> and I mean, there would be no story. So I love that. Um, I love this writer's perspective or this person's perspective and how shocked and disgusted they are by this manly thumb with big knuckles and coarse hair and um, that they're so overwhelmed by the like the mismatch of this thumb with the rest of the person that they can't stop obsessing 
obsessing over it. Like, it doesn't belong there. <laughs> um, so it's just so funny. And sh you can feel this person, like, struggling in their brain to, like, be like, I can get past this, right? I can get past this. And they can't get past it. <laughs> and the only thing this person you know, spends all this time with this woman and then you feel this dainty feminine woman look up into this person's eyes with um, like longing and love and like, oh, thank you for spending so much time with me. <laughs> and then this person is like, reaches over to touch her hand and is like, oh dear God, the thumb. <laughs> And without a word or an apology or anything, just gets up and leaves. <laughs> that this thumb, this oddity, this manly thumb was too much for this person, which I think is hilarious. Um, I like, I really like this uh, piece of writing because I feel like it, um, makes us, there's something very human about it and, um, how, I, I don't know, I like, I feel like humans, like we do struggle with oddities, like when things don't match and we don't know what to do with it. Like we like the idea of things that fit into a nice neat little box <laughs> of perfection. It's fun to think of this with like people and their personalities too. Like when you get to know someone, when you really look at someone and get to know someone and discover them, like there's no way that you can look over every inch of a person inside and out and really not find some oddity, do you think? So I guess I'd be curious to see what you think of this poem. Um, are you afraid of oddities in body or personality? <laughs> um, are you someone who would have found yourself um, intrigued and easily fall in love with this very odd woman? Or would you have been like the person in this piece of prose and found yourself um, appalled and just left without a warning. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think it's great because I'm like, in reality, people are such peculiar creatures and, uh, there is so much about us that is not perfect. And, um, I feel like this poem or this piece of prose just, uh, creates this like contrast of like, beauty and ugliness, femininity and masculinity. Not that masculinity is ugly, like not at all, but just that it's like that soft femininity mixed with that coarse masculinity and um, that there's something about it that's kind of like shocking and like that doesn't match and you're like, ah! <laughs> um, so I guess I'm just curious, like if you encountered this person um, with this oddity, would you find yourself like, oh wow, it's amazing, or would you be appalled and run away like this person? <laughs> um, anyway, that is all. I hope you enjoyed our lovely story, and um, I feel like that'll probably all be all of my exploration of Elizabeth Bishop for now, but I hope I gave you a good taste of her that makes you with like that would make you like to go explore her a little more. Goodbye. <laughs>